Hey everybody, Professor Finn here. Today we're going to look at Chapter 15, Treatments After Embalming. As we've seen in previous chapters, many of the tasks can be done in multiple areas of time, whether it be before, during, or after embalming, depending on uh, the situation that we're in. Generally, this is the list of things that happen after arterial injection post-embalming treatments. So what if you don't have an area of sufficient distribution? The first thing to do is try to inject that area arterially before attacking it with hypodermic needles or surface packs. Once you've tried to do that, then at that point, you should then turn to your supplemental treatments, surface embalming and the hypodermic embalming. Both are generally used to treat small areas. Even if you're using the hypovalve trocar and trying to attack the entire bottom of the leg, you have no idea for the most part how much of that is actually going to preserve, which is why we really want to try to get that done arterially first. So surface embalming is used to treat intact and broken skin. It uh, may be implied internally in the case of an open wound or an autopsy, or more commonly externally for surface discolorations or just some area that needs some extra preservation. The typical chemicals we use for surface embalming are gels, liquids, such as cavity fluids or carbolic acids, and powders, preservative powders. Liquids uh, for surface embalming are categorized generally as both cavity fluid and accessories, phenol, carbolic acid based. Um, you saturate a cotton compress with your fluid, decauterize, dry, and deodorize, and bleach, and then cover that with plastic so that it does its job. You may have to leave these on for several hours. And when you're done, if you've used phenol, you should use some alcohol to inactivate it. So just get some rubbing alcohol and done. Arterial fluid is typically not used because it will stain the tissue way too much. That being said, if you are in a pinch and have nothing else, you could probably get away with it in a non-visible area. But understand, that is not something you should be doing. You should have an adequately stacked um, stocked prep room. Gels, well, historically these were creams. They were like massage cream. They put the preservative right into the cream, and even today you can buy massage cream with a preservative value. Uh, and these creams, formal creams is what they were called, have been replaced by gels. They're available in low viscosity and high viscosity gels. Low viscosity would be something along the lines of maybe a um, thickened milk or a gravy, and high viscosity is the gel as we know it. Um, low viscosity gels are applied to cat cotton compresses, so we'd put the more liquid type onto the cotton and have the cotton hold it in place. With the high viscosity, we could actually paint it right on the area and then cover it. Uh, when used externally, cover with plastic. These are um, preservative value. They usually have formalin. Formalin will cause, you know, for, uh, formaldehyde gas. You don't want to be sniffing that longer than you have to. And when you're done, clean the air with solvent after gel use before medics on. So you would want to get anything left off because it will not probably play well with the cosmetics you wish to use. Under embalmed tissue dehydrates faster than well embalmed tissue. So that's one of the big reasons we want to make sure that we've done our job well. And there's going to be whole chapters dedicated um, to making sure that we have adequate moisture coming up. Glue-wise through reduce dehydration problems, less areas for air to pass into and through, so nothing will dehydrate as quick. Surface compresses can be used followed by cosmetic treatment. With mouth and lips, gives you the um, treatment for that. Go ahead and review it, make your note cards, know what these are. Same thing for eyelids. Nose, um, the only thing about nose I would say is make sure that if you are putting cotton into the nose that it does not flare the nostrils too wide, and certainly make sure you do not see cotton sticking out of the nose or from a viewing angle. For non-visible areas, pretty much you have the entire toolkit. And understand, this does not just say face and hands. It is any viewable area. If someone brings in a short sleeve shirt, your visible area is now from your face up where the shirt sleeve begins. So knowing what clothing you are getting, um, goes a long way with how you're going to treat things. Uh, powders and diapers and plastic garments are common treatments for unautopsied bodies. Powders and gels can be used to treat internal cavity walls, but powders 
are not as effective as gels or liquid. Remember, powders we're going to throw on or throw into more appropriately something, and they're basically going to sit there and rely on the gas to do the work. With gels or liquids, we're going to apply those directly to an area and hold to the area that we want preserved. That's why it's more effective. And if you are using powders, make sure you just didn't grab some calcium carbonate or whiting uh, because that's just a uh, moisture absorber. You want something that has a preservative value. And you will see that in your chemical catalogs. You might see the warning labels on the containers. Outside of surface packs, hypodermic embalming is the next level of treatment. Typically used for very small localized areas, limbs that have not received arterial solution or interior walls of the thorax and abdomen, the flaps of the unautopsied body. Obviously, you need a needle, syringe, hypervalve trocar, infant trocar. Uh, some of these can be connected to the embalming machine, such as the hypovalve or infant trocar. You may have a bit more of a difficult time doing that with a hypodermic needle, but certainly if you have a lure lock adapter, you could hook that up to the machine with varying levels of success. The smaller the gauge, the bigger the needle. So if it's a 9-gauge needle, that is larger than a 22-gauge needle. That is something important to remember. Arterial solution from injection can be used on non-visible areas, so you can take what's left in the tank instead of pouring it down the drain, use it to shoot up the legs. Typical fluids used for visible areas are phenol and cavity fluid. Phenol should only be used for localized discolored tissues when bleaching is desired. You should not be using carbolic acid routinely. If you're looking for better pr preservation and preservative value, go with the cavity fluid. It preserves differently um, than the phenol. Obviously, if you're using the big bad boy, you can use the trocar button to um, close the hole you made. If you're using hypodermic needles, try to make injections from inside cavities, uh, oral cavity, nasal cavity, etc. So leakage will occur inside the body. Then try to use hidden, hidden spots so that you can glue afterwards and the glue will not be seen. Uh, cavity fluid and tissue fluid will leak from punctures unlike tissue builder. Um, one thing I do in my labs is I take tissue builder and incision seal powder and drop it into a small container of water so you can see what it actually does. Um, tissue fluid, that is basically interstitial fluid, anything in the body, will leak out of any hole possible. So you're going to have to glue those later. It tells you uh, going forward different areas that you can do with hypodermic and um, proper hidden places to inject from. I'm just going to kind of go through this. This is something that you can kind of read on your own. So if you have a large area, maybe you had, you know, um, blockage in the arteries, maybe you had gangrene or you had a ridiculous amount of edema, you're usually going to have to do more than just one treatment. So in this case, you're going to be doing all of them. And you can apply that concept to anywhere you have a complication. But remember, when you have one of these big issues, generally, you're going to be using some sort of plastic garment or covering in plastic when you are done so that you do not run into a situation where you're trashing casket and trashing clothes. When we are done working, how do we close things up? Two general ways. We don't generally use staple guns in the funeral industry. We use suturing, needle and thread, and we use glues. So, usually, we do not suture until after cavity aspiration. And the reason being is that by having the trocar in there, it is reducing the amount of leakage that might happen. Uh, one of my uh, favorite practices is I will begin aspiration, uh, heading superior towards the head. I'll park my trocar in the region of the uh, upper right shoulder and I will try to drain anything that might interfere with me suturing my right common carotid. Um, make sure all your vessels are tied off. Okay? So get in there, make sure your ligatures are nice and tight. Uh, if you want to, you could take a small locking uh, hemostat and place it over the vessel. If you know for a fact that you will never go back in and kind of seal it off while you're doing some terminal disinfection before you suture, kind of seal the thing. But if you do that, understand you won't be able to open it back up without making that incision wider, probably. Uh, that is something that I've done on very extreme cases where I just absolutely have to get that vessel um, sealed up. 
Force out as much liquid as possible. Use digital pressure, squeezing with your hands. Use a pneumatic uh, collar. Uh, I've even resorted in some cases, found a blood pressure cuff sitting at a local thrift store for a dollar. I've used that um, for limited purposes for legs and stuff like that, attempt to squeeze out some things. Dry the incision, okay? Use a cauterant pack. Put in some cotton, pour some um, carbolic acid on there, and let it sit. You'd be surprised how well that will just seal everything up for you. Uh, use incision sealing powder after you've made several sutures to ensure the powder stays in the body. The way I tell my students this is as you are suturing, when you are about halfway through your suture, pull it up a little bit, put your incision seal powder in there, and then complete what you're doing. With suturing, we have different types of thread. Linen is stronger than cotton. We usually use linen for autopsies, long bone donors, vessel incision sutures, um, basically more multi-purpose. Cotton we can use for some fine things. I don't use cotton that often. I don't generally like it. Wax linen is my preferred. Uh, and dental floss can be used in a pinch for visible areas and also on children. When you are doing restorative sutures, the type of needle you're going to need is a 3 8 inch circle needle. You could also use this for incision sutures. I'm not a big fan of the circular needle. Um, I tend to use one of the varying sizes of S needle, uh, which is the next one, double curved autopsy needle, an S needle is used to close all the big stuff because it's usually much larger and does not exhaust your hand as much. These do come in varying sizes, which is why I like them. Uh, and I generally use a smaller one for um, features and anything else I might need them for. I definitely like needles that have the eye, uh, which allows for easier threading. You just kind of push it in and it slides through. Keep needles sharp. Your needles should never be dull. That is a parenteral risk. It might you know, pop off and stab you. You might have to put too much pressure and it pokes through at the wrong time. Um, so you just get yourself a little sharpening stone and sharpen your needles. If the needle gets rusty or really is past the point of no return, dispose of it in your sharps container, buy some new ones. Always pull on the thread. Okay, Pull on the thread, not the needle, because the needle will fray and snap, and then you're going to have to try to re-thread and hope you have enough thread um, as you re-thread the needle in order to continue what you were doing. Bombers use single or double-stranded threads. I'm a big fan of the single strand I've done. Uh, I don't usually get leaky incisions by doing that. I know some people complain about that. I'm not a big fan of the double-stranded because of the uh, nature of what it leaves behind, but again, when it absolutely has to be done, a double-stranded thread works well, and I'll typically use double-stranded thread anytime I have to suture an autopsy. If you're using cotton, double the thread. If you're using three or four twist linen, same exact thing. If it's a very small thread, three or four twist is fairly thin, you're probably going to want to double it up because otherwise it might snap or cut into something. A single strand works best with thicker threads. Five or basically better strand. This now gives you the direction of suturing. And so you have to remember, this is based on the textbook positioning of where you should be, not where a lot of people actually do things. So for instance, with the common carotid, you're supposed to stand at the head of the table looking down on the body. Many of us stand to the side of the table um, looking at the body, which then kind of throws these things out of whack. So if I was to say, here is my embalming table. The book says we need to stand here. Here's my miraculous Van Gogh. And this is where every one of these things comes from, telling us what directions to go and whatnot. Many of us will stand over here, um, which then kind of throws things out of kilter. So just remember, we're going by the textbook place where you should be standing. So if you made the parallel incision that follows along the artery, suture from the bottom to the top, okay, top. If you did the supraclavicular, the one right above the clavicle, start in the middle and go to the end. Now that is the textbook. If you are standing on the side, okay, if you're standing on the side over here, 
This is not something you would be tested on. It would not be something I would um, ask on a test. This is for professional practice. What you should always do is start on your non-dominant hand. So if I am standing here and I am a right-handed person, I would start to my left, which in this case would be the exact opposite of what the book says, and work my way down so that the thread and nothing else gets in my way. If I was a lefty, I would start on the right and work my way up. This is why people get these questions wrong, because they think about where they usually stand or where they've stood in prep centers, and that's not where the book has you standing. Axillary medial towards lateral. So now we've seen, so far, anything above the belly button, if it is something that goes right or left, we start in the middle, we work our way out. Brachial, medial to lateral, start towards the trunk, work our way out. And the same exact thing with radial and ulnar, with the arm abducted, medial, closest point to the body, to the fingertips. That can also be applied to the common carotid. You start closest to the trunk, and then work your way away from the body. With the femoral, it's the exact opposite. You start at the bottom and work your way to the top, inferior to superior, towards the feet, and then work towards the trunk. I find that to be extraordinarily uncomfortable when standing in the normal place. So I will encourage you, whatever works for you in the real world, do it. But for testing purposes, this is the answer. When you're doing an autopsy, it is important that you align the skin. So the first thing you're probably going to do is take all three flaps and do one stitch to hold them in place to make sure everything is aligned there. And then maybe, if you need to, put some more just quick one stitch, little bridge suture, um, to hold the skin in place while you're preparing to do the long one. Begin at the bottom. Begin at the pubic symphysis, the pelvis, and then suture towards the top of the body. You will then continue up one shoulder. And then you will restart and then suture the other shoulder independently. If you're doing the knee, below the belly button. Start at the bottom, work your way up. And then same exact thing with the tibia. It says begin distal and work superior. Again, this would be towards the foot toward, and then work towards the top. Review the different types of sutures, the steps in making. I'm going to cover some highlights, but, you know, nothing beats reading. An individual suture, a bridge suture, I just talked about that. This is only used to align tissues. These are generally temporary. These are not meant to be something that we keep in long term. Um, usually, we're going to replace them with something else. Baseball is the one we most commonly use. It's considered airtight, not watertight. On long incisions... Every five inches, but every, you know, depending on who you are, about maybe every five or six stitches. Um, do a locking stitch so that you do not undo your work. The intradermal or hidden suture. One needle, a single thread used on visible areas. Uh, line up your margins. Things need to match up. Leave no gaps between stitches. Puckering occurs if you pull the thread too tight. This is not airtight, and it most certainly is not watertight. The double is the same exact thing with two on a single piece of thread. It uh, has greater holding ability than a single. One of my favorites, the inversion or worm suture, gathers in and turns excess tissue. Uh, pattern is similar to a single intradermal. Makes stitches uniform in length. Not visible, is easily waxed over. Excellent for carotid incisions or scalp incisions. Uh, generally not airtight, uh, certainly not leak-proof. So if you anticipate leaking, this might not be the best one for you to use, uh, but it is certainly a very good alternative to the baseball for any visible area. The lock suture, well, this is, you know, when you absolutely positively have to get it locked. Ha, this is the one. This is the big guns. It has a very unsightly ridge. It's a baseball uh, suture, a baseball stick that passes through the loop. And holds the thread down in place. This is airtight. It is usually leak proof if you've done it properly and not left any gaps by pulling some flush through or something. Um, this you're going to use every five or six stitches, five inches, whatever it says in the book, to go ahead and hold your work down. The whip suture, 
Uh, generally, I don't like this used to close long incisions. Uh, they use this to prevent leakage of fluid during transfer of body. Organ retrieval techs use this as well. I typically will not use this when I have the options of baseball or something else. Purse string used to close round openings. Um, in severely decomposed bodies, uh, especially uh, bodies that have atrophy of the anus, or if you just have a trocar butt that doesn't want to stay put, you might have to use a purse string or end suture. Outside of thread, adhesives are your second line up. If you're working on infants or something like that, they may be preferred to close things up instead of thread. Um, most superglues work in the presence of slight moisture. If you read the instructions, it says wet the area slightly, it needs the water. So make sure you do that for a best effect. Excellent for closing jagged tears and sometimes um, used for cranial autopsies. IVs. Don't touch IVs until after you're done embalming. It didn't hurt them while they were alive, and it's going to cause more harm than good if you take it out before arterial injection. So leave those things in place. Uh, punctures can be sealed with superglue, tissue builder, or phenol later. If you're re removing something larger, put a trocar button in it. So something like a feeding tube sticking out of an abdomen or um, some type maybe drain catheter, you can sip it off and then just plug a hole with a trocar button or practice your, uh, your purse string. Pacemakers are typically removed prior to cremation. Um, usually have to get extra permission to do that. It's why you need to ask. That is not something that is automatic, but we usually have them built into our cremation authorizations. Um, radioactive pacemakers need to be returned. Those are more and more rare. Uh, and you will know if you get one because it'll have the radiation symbol on it. Make an incision, remove the device, and then suture it. It really, really is simple to um, retrieve one of these and then dispose of it appropriately. Colostomies um, gives you the definition of a colostomy and a stoma, and it gives you the process. I know a lot of professionals just kind of leave these things in place, no harm, no foul. But realistically, we're supposed to remove the bag, disinfect it, and then dispose of it. We then disinfect the body and stoma with a surface pack. We force things back in, we suture it shut, and then we seal the hole. That is the proper textbook way of dealing with this. Surgical drains, kind of the same exact, um, same exact thing we just saw. Remove the drain, purse string it shut. If it's small enough, just use a trocar button. Uh, treat with surface adhesive to make sure it doesn't leak. With your final washing and drying, your terminal disinfection. Um, and understand, when I use the word terminal disinfection, it means more than just the final washing and you know, disinfection of the body. It involves you know, the prep room and everything else. But I have a tendency to use the word terminal disinfection to include the final washing. Uh, when all incisions are sealed and all the punctures are closed, wash and dry the body one last time. Get any blood off of the body. That is imperative. It will discolor, it will stink, it will trash clothing, it will trash casket pillows. Small amount of bleach can be used in your cleaning solution to help you with things. Uh, remember, bleach and formaldehyde don't quite mix. Wash the hair thoroughly. Several times if you have to get rid of the dandruff, uh, cool air to dry hair pieces, naturally curled hair and perms. Consult fan for combing out braids or dreads. Uh, and this brings up a, uh, a point. Now, I live in Miami. Um, I've worked in Pinellas County. I live in basically a very large ethnic melting pot. You need to wash people's hair. They have dreadlocks. an excuse to not wash their hair. The hair needs to be properly washed. Um, you might need to hire a stylist if you are unfamiliar with certain ethnic hairstyles to return it to normal. But that's the cost of doing business and that needs to be discussed with the family. Dry body carefully. Mold is a bad, bad thing for you. Uh, make sure you get the back. Make sure you get the table. Because if you're going to leave the body on the uh, embalming table may, maybe overnight, uh, you do not want any moisture underneath it. That will cause problems for you, and uh, maybe like skin slip and odor. So what happens if you have an open wound, an ulcer, lesion, maybe some surface discoloration? Well, for the most part, we're going to break up those supplementary embalming procedures, the surface compresses and injection. And any compress used during embalming should be removed. Fresh one placed once you are done um, doing your arterial injection during your final washing and drying. Bleaching chemicals can be used on discoloration. It's kind of a no-brainer. It's what you want it to do. If you're
if you're in a rush, you can kind of just go in with the hypo and put the bleaching chemical in there directly. Understand, any sort of bleaching effect is essentially only temporary. Uh, it will lighten the bruise, but it will not make the bruise go away. We've beaten purge to death in other chapters. If you've packed orifices prior to embalming, take out the nasty stuff, put in new stuff. Um, when packing, you might want to pack nose. You might want to pack, we definitely should pack the anus. Um, depending on the laws of your state, you may have to pack the vagina. And I know in Texas, they require um, packing of the shaft of the penis. They view the orifice at the tip of the penis um, as an orifice. So you need to probably pack that as well. I know the layman just kind of tie a piece of ligature around uh, the shaft of the penis and they're done with it. But realistically, if they say pack it, they mean pack it. If you encounter um, the down and dirty anal purge, force out more. You know, get as much of the poopy out as you can. You're just going to have to deal with it. That's part of the charm of the job. Uh, you can even raise the legs. That causes you abdominal pressure, and that pushes out the dookie as well. Um, you might want to use an AV plug. I kind of prefer AV plugs over cotton if I can, you know, use them. And, folks, promise me, you know, that you do this because you do not want a lawsuit because you did not pack the anal cavity. Um, here in Miami, we've actually had some cases that we've worked on where the anus, for lack of use because of uh, ostomies or from, you know, other tubes they've had put in, is completely atrophied. Uh, and an AV plug is useless, so you have to use cotton. Always leave a little bit of cotton hanging out so it plugs the orifice. If you just ram everything in there, um, something might get around it. You want to leave a little bit protruding so that the hole is actually sealed. If you have swelling, you may need to try to reduce it before the visitation. That's cute. You're probably going to want to do more than just try. Okay? It's vital you document swelling. It's vital that you document if they came in with it. It's vital that you document if it happened during embalming and the steps you did to try to reduce it. Um, we're going to beat swelling to death in other chapters, especially when it's associated with something like edema or injection. So I'm really not going to go deep in it. Read these items. You know, here's, here's your laundry list of what to do um, for the different areas as well. Resetting and gluing. After embalming, you might have to fix things depending on how things filled out. Um, it's easy to add or subtract cotton. Pull some out, put some in, maybe take some tissue builder, just kind of inject it. I would say start with the non-invasive pokey hole thing. And if you're going to have to poke holes, try to poke the holes from inside somewhere so anything that would leak would leak inside the body. Um, obviously, re replace anything prior to embalming in regards to cotton packing or a towel packing with fresh stuff. And keep glues behind weather lines on lips. You do not want the glues protruding where they have the opportunity to react with the cosmetic and just look nasty. Super glue works well in closing the inner canthus of the eye. If you are going to do that, you probably want to use something with a short, um, very precise tip so you can accurately place the super glue. Just don't kind of jam it in the eye because it will form that nasty white coating stuff and away you go. Um, personally, I just prefer to use wax to close the inner canthus of the eye when I you know, have to do something like that. If you need to stretch something, maybe like an eyelid or... Um, the lower eyelid in order to get that canthus closed, use a blunt instrument. Try not to grab a pair of forceps, i.e. tweezers, and kind of pull around. Um, that is usually going to abrade the eyelid, and now you're definitely going to have to use cosmetic because you got a little mark where you grabbed everything. And don't be stingy with your plastic garments. They're a quick and efficient way to prevent a lawsuit. They're relatively inexpensive. You can make some on the fly if you need to. Uh, I've said this in other lectures. I'll say it in lectures coming up. If you are in an absolute pinch, a garbage bag with two holes cut on the uh, bottom corners for legs makes a great little capri garment. Um, but you should have actual garments in your funeral home for use. Do not just be using garbage bags. Use a garment always slightly larger than you need. You do not want to run the risk of ripping these things, which they are notorious for doing, especially unionals. So I go through the garments for you. Stockings need no introduction. Sleeves are basically stockings without feet, right? Uh, so if you need to make a sleeve and all you have are these guys, cut the foot off and tape the bottom around the wrist. 
Here's where people start having some problems. Coverall, capris, and all sorts of other good stuff. So a coverall covers the torso and the abdomen. So basically from the chest, the nipple area, all the way down to the upper leg. So if you get a question that says, what's the best one to use, and you just need to cover the torso and the, upper, and the uh, abdomen itself, this is probably the best one. Some people confuse this with the capri. Unionol is the onesie. It covers the entire body except for the hands and the head. Zippers up the front. And the cute thing about these guys, as with any plastic garment, is when you the white, like you see right here, all this sort of good stuff, there's some over here, that is a cloth that will wick moisture. So when you see in the chapters it says cover these things with surface glue and tapes, it means that because if anything gets wet, it will pull it right, right to it. And here's your capri. Here's your capri. Capri is basically a pair of pants. Covers the abdomen, belly button down, all the way to the feet. When you are asked questions regarding these documents, it is imperative that you find the garment that covers the issue. If it's a full body issue, it's the union all. If it's basically the torso by itself, it's a coverall. If it's an arm, it's a sleeve. If it's a leg only, it is, um, it's a stocking. Do not just say, oh, union all will fix everything. You do not need all of it. Okay, You don't need all of it. And that's what they're asking you about. So as I said earlier, I usually refer to terminal disinfection uh, when I'm talking about uh, washing the body. That is, in my opinion, part of it. Okay? So terminal disinfection is what happens after the embalming process, the sanitation of instruments, cleaning the prep room, and cleaning yourself. Your disinfectants need to have this laundry list of good stuff. Wide range of activity. Kills damn near anything. Sufficient strength to do that job. Axe in water is stable, has a good shelf life, so you don't have to use it within like three days. Non-corrosive to your expensive instruments. Axe fast. You don't want to have to let it sit there for two days to disinfect the surface. You know, five to ten minutes. Uh, and it's not highly toxic. Some things may be good disinfectants, but if they kill you as well, that's kind of a problem. With your embalming machine flush with warm water, you could use ammonia in warm water to remove residues. After using cleansers, ammonia flush again with warm water because you don't want residual ammonia to counteract with your next batch of formaldehyde. And then refill with some water to keep gaskets moist and allow the water time to relieve any gases present. Um, different people do different things. When I fill up my embalming machine and I put the water back in, uh, I like to put in my bottle of water corrective immediately because water here in Florida is really, really nasty. Uh, the other thing that I might do, depending on if I use that machine often, because here at the lab we have three stations, three machines. If I know I'm not going to use that second or third machine for a while, I'll probably put in something like a co-injection fluid uh, just to keep everything even more lubricated because of the quote-unquote storage period between use. Surfaces, cool water, antiseptic soap. Um, we use a, a, a Lysol-styled spray to remove and disinfect our areas. Um, Get rid of all the junk first. You don't want to disinfect junk. So clean it all off and then disinfect it. Bleach and water make a great disinfectant because bleach kills everything. Uh, it also could uh, have reaction surfaces. So be aware that you try something first before you go in there and discolor everything and upset your boss. Clean everything, under tables, around the drains, and even get on top of lights. Dust and bacteria and stuff like that, aerosol. If they get on the light, they can breathe there. So make sure you do something about it. Your instruments, this is kind of a no-brainer. Clean them before you put them in the drip tray or you put them into your sterilizer, whatever you're going to do with them. I know some places buy a nice um, family-styled stainless steel dishwasher for a couple hundred bucks, and they have a disinfection cycle. They clean it all off, they slap it in the dishwasher, and they run it through a disinfection cycle. Uh, whatever. Just make sure it's clean first. Make sure you're disposing of anything sharp in the proper container, a sharps container. And at a minimum, if you are going to use a cold sterilant, 45 minutes. 45 minutes to kill just about everything. But if you do have a case of tissue gas, gas gangrene, where uh, clostridium perfringens is involved, you're looking at several hours. So I'd probably separate those uh, from anything else I'm using, drop them in a separate container, and just let that stuff sit overnight. Make sure you to these after use. And if you are using reusable, i.e. a surgical gown, uh, make sure that you take it off and that you launder it. 
Um, obviously, if you have cut or punctured yourself, you need to stop what you're doing and fix that. Disinfect, induce bleeding, call a physician. You might have to go to the emergency room and get um, the battery of shots and whatnot. That's always fun. And then document everything. Document everything you did, the condition when it's done. Um, and we'll talk more about it in a much later chapter, but this is a good thing. Make sure you always put the hands to the side on your ship outs so that the hands aren't all marked up by the straps. Make sure you dress them. So examination should be made before and after each visitation period. Now, throughout this book, it talks about different ways of monitoring a body. Understand what it's talking about here is the actual visitation. So I know in Florida we live in a very mobile, very fast society. Uh, we generally don't have the three-day or double viewing days. I've had some of them, but they were not the bread and butter of the business, whereas other areas of the country, um, you know, it's three days of viewing, two sessions each day. It is what it is. So if you are doing something like that, you need to go in and check the body between every session and make sure that the makeup is okay, that nothing is purging, and business is, business is normal. If you do get some discoloration showing, break out the opaque. You know, you should have painted a realistic expectation for the family. If you have an uncasketed body, okay, preserved uncasketed body, check it daily. Now, later on, you're going to see um, in another chapter where it talks about uh, long-term storage of a body and checking it every, I think it's three days. Do not confuse that with this. If you have a body sitting in your funeral home waiting to be cosmetized and casketed for a funeral at the end of the week, you need to be checking that body on a daily basis. If you have a body in the morgue, your refrigerated area, that is waiting for a service three months from now, hypothetically, you will want to check that, according to your book, a minimum every three or four days. Um, I would advise you to check it daily like this. Okay, but know that there is a difference between them. Many of the treatments and monitoring of body have been covered in other areas. I'm just going to throw some highlights at you, and there they are. Um, the big one there, protect clothing. Protect clothing using plastic garments and sheeting. Um, use uh, tape to seal the edges of the plastic garments where they had that cloth. And again, garbage bags are really, really useful for us. You don't have to go buy the most expensive ones. Buy the cheapy roll. And then use that to create plastic sheets that you can put down the fronts of shirts to protect collars, make bibs to protect ties and suits, uh, anything that you might need. The funeral home I used to work for, we used those cheapy little garbage bag rolls an awful lot for just about everything. Ship outs, you name it, uh, because it was a cheap way to make plastic sheeting. We have whole chapters dedicated to purge, no brainer. If it's purging, reaspirate. If it's coming out the mouth, you're probably going to have to open the mouth, clean out the mouth, and maybe repack it. So I hope you have a convenient way to do that. Your little buddy here, maggot, check for fly eggs. Maggots are pretty cool little creatures, other than they look like something really, really weird. Um, you're going to have to use a petroleum product, Vaseline, for instance, with a cotton swab to get larvae to come to the surface. They can't breathe. They will come to the air. Old? Well, mold is a problem. Mold, there's no easy fix. With mold, you have to dry the body completely. Then you're going to have to cut off the mold. Okay? You're either going to burn it off with a spatula or you're going to carve it off with a scalpel. You're going to then cauterize the area with phenol to try to kill anything that's left. You're going to place embalming powder, preservative powder, inside the plastic garment, preferably that's also a mold retardant. And this is a huge issue with stored bodies. So in a highly humid environment like we have in Florida, it is imperative that if you see a mold issue occurring, that you treat it. Folks, thank you for your attention. We'll see you next chapter.